And I think his blog entries are pretty general, even though he acts like they're very vulnerable. Like, I don't know, they seem like chicken soup for the marketing soul to me. But anyway. Hey everyone, welcome to Nicole Reacts, where I, Nicole, react to online marketing guru trainings that I find on the internet. My qualifications for snark and commentary are that I have owned a marketing company for the last 14 years. In addition to that, I've started a couple of small businesses in that time. So I've seen marketing both from the agency providing marketing services side of things, as well as the small business owner needing marketing services side of things. So pretty comprehensive. If you enjoy hearing from me, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, and if you just want to get to watch other content, the YouTube channel has tons of playlists. There's over 200 videos on it, close to 300 at this point. Or you can check out the blog, which I started before I started the business. So the blog is 15 years old. There's literally 1,500 blog posts on lots of different subject matters. So if you want to hear more from me, those are two good places to go. So today's person is Seth Godin, who's unlike the previous gurus I've reacted to, is actually pretty well-respected in the marketing community. He was an early investor in a dot-com business. And so that's, it sounds like where he made his money. He launched Squidoo, which I vaguely remember in 2008. And it was one of the most visited websites in the world at that point. And he sold it to Hub Pages, which is another thing you might've heard of if you were in the internet space in the late 2000s, early 2010s. The previous gurus, some of which we've talked about, have tried to tell you when you watch their videos that they can make you a thought leader if you, if you follow their techniques. Whereas like Seth Godin is an actual thought leader. I'm not saying I don't think he's a smart guy because I think he is. I just sometimes don't get what people are, are so obsessed about um, with him. When I was first starting my marketing business, people recommended me his books. And I, like I said, I, I did uh, read some of them and I have gotten stuff out of him. I have taken one of his courses. I forget what it was. It was like 150 ish bucks a few years ago. And it was a good course. It, it was fine. I, I think it was worth the amount of money I paid for it. One thread throughout all of Seth Godin's work through the decades is the idea of permission marketing. So if you think about more old school advertisements, they were more disruptive or interruptive. So it would be a video that played you know, a commercial that while you were watching your favorite TV show, or it would be a pop-up banner that showed up as you were looking at a website. But now marketing works a lot differently with this idea that as companies, we're trying to win people's attention and get them to opt in versus forcing ourselves on them. So Seth Godin has written Wikipedia says numerous books, but it looks like 30-ish one of the more popular ones, which you may have heard of, came out in 2004 and was called Purple Cow. Now, my sort of toxic trait with self-help books is that I find that they're very repetitive. So I'll read something and understand it, and then they'll go on for 25 more pages with like 100 different kinds of examples showing this thing that I already understand. So Purple Cow is about providing remarkable products and services. And by being remarkable, people will talk about you like the purple cow. I don't know if you read purple cow and got way more out of it than that, please tell me. But like, that's what I got out of it. So like I said, he's written lots of books about marketing. He was inducted into the American Marketing Association's Hall of Fame in 2018. One of the primary places that Seth Godin continues to publish is on his blog, which is known for his short but profound blog entries. And again, I've had people send me these blog entries and I'm like, okay, like this is a nice idea, but like, I don't feel like it's remarkable. Again, I might be an asshole. I don't know. But um, I felt some kinship with Seth Godin because when I started my blog, I started with TypePad because at the time, and I'm forgetting who it was, one of my favorite bloggers used TypePad and I wanted to do a little bit more than the blogger software that came with Google did at that time. So I signed up with a paid account at TypePad and started blogging there. And when I learned about Seth Godin, I saw that he had a TypePad blog as well. And you know what? He had that TypePad blog for years. And if you do look at TypePad, and I'll put Seth Godin's blog, what it looked like up until very recently on the screen here. TypePad looks like it's from 2008. Like it just looks that way. <laughs> but I see that he's had a redesign or a rebrand 
probably because someone finally told him, hey, listen, it's cute that you're using this old technology, but we probably should move you to a more easy to read dynamic web platform for you to publish your articles. So today's video is Seth Godin. This is marketing, how to find your viable audience in WinTrust. It's from London Reels YouTube channel. It's about 45 minutes long. And uh, yeah, let's see what Seth Godin has to teach us about marketing. So London Real has grown dramatically in eight years and almost no one in the world knows who you are. 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet have never heard of you, have never seen one of your videos. And that's okay. 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, it would be enough. Because otherwise you're going to start chasing a Kardashian. My definition of marketing doesn't match what some people's definition of marketing is. I define marketing as anything we do that changes the culture for the better. If you think back just a hundred years ago, when women didn't even have the right to vote yet, when it wasn't exceptional at all to be overtly racist, that there were just expectations in our culture that we have moved past. I think that each of us, if you've got a keyboard, has a chance to speak up in a certain way. Whatever it is you think is important begins with the word. It begins with what are you going to say next that would transform them once they engage with it. Part of what we get stuck on is we say, oh no, something big is about to happen here. And so we have a problem. And it's coming at the very same time that people are looking deep inside themselves and saying, is this all there is? Clearly there's more than this. And the happiest people aren't the people who are spending all day on Facebook. They're not the people who are spending all day trying to get more followers. They're not the people who have the most money. So the thinking of advertising needs to be who's in the emotional state, demographically, psychographically, emotionally ready to move that I could put an ad in front of. I don't blog every day because I have a new blog ready. I blog every day because it's tomorrow. Okay, I know we had inspirational music behind that. And I would sort of grasp onto parts of sentences he was saying. I, I found that a little vague. Did you find that a little vague too? Maybe he'll get into it. Maybe that just was the cut reel to get us excited about what we're about to watch. But I found that a bit confusing myself. Hey guys, editing Nicole. I finally made it. I got my first copyright claim. It was basically for me showing the opening of the London Reel video. Um, I'll, so I'll just describe what was there. It was this guy, Brian Rose, who's going to be the dude in the aggressively red necktie interviewing Seth Godin. He's running a race. He's standing in front of crowds. He's uh, drinking slowly from what looks like a nice mug. You know, I think his trailer just feels like a sort of popularity yes with the speaking and all that but also like experiences with the marathon and sort of some cultural stuff in there anyway the original video is linked if you want to go watch it but apparently i can't comment on it so, so that's what that's about i will say that i feel like i just watched a commercial for seth godin and then i was immediately shown another commercial for london real whoever that main guy was and I will say, if we compare the London Real sort of trailer to the Gary V and the Kevin David trailer from previous videos, we'll see that we did see sort of a little bit of a lifestyle flex here in terms of like the large crowd of people, you know, him talking in front of that fancy looking camera. But it was more like showing experiences and less of showing stuff. And I'm wondering how much of that is cultural. So like, in the Kevin David video and the Gary V video, we're seeing like planes and, and fancy cars and awards. And in this video, we're seeing him running a marathon and him being at these important events and him kind of being a thought leader. And underneath that, rather than it just being a music, you know, little short music clip, it was him saying something. It was kind of, I don't know, vaguely motivational versus the Gary V and the Kevin David trailer just establishing their authority as rich 
people who know what they're doing. This seems like this guy has a message that he wants to push a little bit more. Um, I'd be curious if we watch the other London Reel videos, if they all started the same way. But uh, let's continue. When it comes to marketing, it doesn't get much better than Seth Godin. In fact, he redefines what you think marketing is. And that's why I love this incredible episode. Some of his works include Purple Cow, Lynchpin, The Dip, where he goes through some really fascinating concepts about human beings. The Dip is all about when you first learn something, you get really good at it, and then you start to suck at it. And if you put in the work, then you become the master. Purple Cow is what it says. When you see something that's a purple cow, wow, that is incredible marketing. And we went on and on and on. Seth blogs every day. He says that's more important than training meditation, any other kind of practice. And he also has a lot to say about what he calls the industrial education complex. Seth Godin isn't the first person to understand the sort of transformational or learning opportunities that writing on a regular basis provides. I know when I was in high school, I read the book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameroon. And one of the things she said in there was to write morning pages. And the idea of morning pages is that you wake up in the morning and you have a set amount of pages you've decided to fill, two, three, whatever. And you do that first thing. You, you fill up those pages when you get up. And at first your body doesn't want to do it. And so you end up, you know, saying, I'm just filling the page, you know, writing over and over again, I'm just filling the page or, or some other similar thing to that. But after a while, some switch goes off and you're starting to have like ideas, you're starting to process things. It's almost like you're training your brain to work differently. And with blogging, there's an added component to it. So Seth Godin blogs every day. I didn't realize he blogged every day, I guess, until now. But um, he, besides writing, is also putting it out onto the internet and getting feedback from people about the writing. Now, I actually when I started this blog, I turned it into a daily blog for, I think, four years. I'll have to double check. But I mean, I have like 1,700 blog posts on my website. And if you do the math, you realize that the only way it could get there is if at one part of this, I was blogging every day. And, you know, it was really great, not only to give me a lot of writing practice relatively quickly, but also, you know, in the kind of mid 2000s, there really wasn't a lot going on on social media. So the blog comment section was really where a lot of conversation was happening. And I have always loved writing. Even when I was a little kid, I had, I had journals from when I was a little kid of stories I would write. But when I discovered blogging and the fact that I could put something out there and get immediate feedback and start having conversations with people, that format really spoke to me. So I'm not surprised if Seth Godin believes in sort of that feedback and growth and write, getting better at writing that he would have a practice of writing every day and he might as well be a blog. So I think it's interesting he opposes the traditional education system. Listen, I'm not saying that the college industrial complex or whatever that guy said isn't something we need to think about as a society. But I am a little suspicious when the person saying that sells a program called Alt MBA. Just gonna put that out there. Let's continue. That all of us went to school to learn to be a worker bee, and we were not taught to think outside the box. And that's what his book Lynchpin is all about. Someone that can go out there and make things happen. That's the kind of person I wanna hire, and that's the kind of person you wanna learn how to be as opposed to someone who just takes orders or memorizes things or do what they're told. I love sitting down with Seth. I've been waiting. As a kid who was really good at going to school and really kind of worried about going out in the real world because I was so good at school, I think that the right teachers and the right programs do teach you how to think for yourself. I Maybe I've just had a lot of good luck with some really good teachers, but I just want to throw that out there that you can have an educator in a traditional education system that doesn't train you to be a worker bee. And that expects you to think for yourself. And to do this interview for over three years, and this man did not disappoint. 
So much to think about, so much to learn. He's got an incredible podcast and he's always on the cutting edge of marketing. So get your pen and paper ready because Seth Godin is about to take you to school. This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Seth Godin, often described as the ultimate entrepreneur for the information age. You've written 19 books on marketing, including Lynchpin, The Dip, Purple Cow, Tribes, and This Is Marketing, all worldwide bestsellers. You've also created the most successful marketing blog in the world, and you've been inducted into the Marketing Hall of Fame. In 2018, you launched Akimbo, a podcast where you share ideas around business, marketing, and culture. Your Akimbo workshops have changed the lives of more than 14,000 people in 70 countries with your online Alt-MBA, accelerating personal and professional transformation by providing an extensive view of leadership, organizations, and change. Seth, welcome to London Real in New York City. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming all this way. My pleasure. It's great. Why is it called London Real if it's in New York City? I'm going to look maybe into that after this. Great to have you here. You know, as I look through all of your work, Seth, I always wonder if you might have inherited some type of marketing gene, you know, if it's somehow in your blood. And I'm wondering if you, if you were always this way as a kid, you know, were you eight years old giving lectures to your classmates about marketing? Because it seems to be part of who you are. Well, we need to clarify something right from the start. Okay. My definition of marketing doesn't match what some people's definition of marketing is. I do not define marketing as hype, advertising, promotion, scamming, selfish, narcissistic, short-term thinking, which is what a lot of people think of when they do marketing or when they are a marketer. I define marketing as anything we do that changes the culture for the better. If you're willing to take responsibility for the work you're doing and you're bringing something to the world, then you're a marketer. Because if you do it better, it's going to work better than if you don't. And so, yeah, I've written uh, those bestsellers, but almost none of them belong in the, quote, marketing section because they're about things like culture or technology or how we organize to move forward. So... I agree. You know, I think part of my issue with Seth Godin's books are that I was told they were marketing books and I was trying to run a marketing company. And when I started, I, I was in a 220 square foot apartment. I was really nervous how it was going to go and had these very real problems in front of me. And I thought, okay, if I read a marketing book, it'll help me run my marketing business better. But a lot of his stuff is about like, like he said, like leadership and, and creating company culture. And I was like, I'm just a woman in a studio apartment trying to make more than $250 a month on this. So I don't know, maybe I just didn't have the the privilege of having, I guess, the financial and other bandwidth to be able to see my company in this large scale way like I would be able to now. Have I been a marketer my whole life? I think everyone has. But I think that I've been more intentional about it from a really young age. Not because I was born with it. None of us were born able to walk or talk but because I decided it was important and I practiced it. Okay. Were you always looking for ways to make yourself better or make the world better when you were a kid? Or did that come later you know, through university and after that, when you started starting your own businesses and started yeah, writing? Yeah, you know, I was really lucky with where I grew up and how I grew up. I won the birthday lottery. And um, certainly with, you know, the privilege that comes from being born in 1960 and where I was born, but also... Uh, my parents. My dad was the volunteer head of the United Way. My mom was the first woman on the board of the art museum in town. So Buffalo, New York is a little tiny place. Uh, not that big a community of people who are leading. And so my parents certainly weren't wealthy, but we grew up acting like we uh, were leaders in the community. And so there were always people traipsing through my house. And I grew up thinking it was normal to decide to contribute in some way through example, through direct contribution, whatever it was. That's what normalized in my house. And part of the work I'm trying to do in the culture is now that we are not just in our house, but online, the more we see that, the more we learn that what's expected of you is that you will be part of something and make that thing better, the more likely people will act that way. I always watch you know, the stories of the Kennedys and it feels like they all, knew they had to contribute. I mean, you can, you know, love or hate their politics, but it felt like on that compound, they were always looking at everyone like, what are you gonna do for the world? But that is a cultural thing because not everyone grew up with that expectation. So Seth Godin and the Kennedys 
And I can include myself in the group of people that I'm referencing here. Grew up privileged. We all grew up with families who made enough money working probably one full-time job to support all the needs in the household. And by having to only work 40 hours a week and making enough money in those 40 hours a week to provide for needs, they had enough bandwidth, they had enough free time, and they had enough energy to be leaders in the community, to volunteer for worthy causes, to contribute and create community events. And seeing that behavior modeled does make an impression on you. I know for me, I have always felt and expected of myself that I should be giving back a lot. In particular, I think because I chose at a young age that I wasn't going to have any children. And I knew that if, you know, some of my friends were going to spend two decades raising the next generation and I had a comparable amount of free time, I should be contributing in positive ways to society. I feel differently about that after the pandemic, of course, but um, yeah, I think these things are being said with a lot of privilege, and I will be curious if that privilege is acknowledged in this broadcast. But in case it isn't, I'm acknowledging it now. That's right. And it's still a choice because some people who grew up with that expectation go in the opposite direction. But I think this idea of what we normalize in our culture is so important. If you think back just a hundred years ago when women didn't even have the right to vote yet, when uh, it wasn't uh, exceptional at all to be overtly racist, that there were just expectations in our culture that we have moved past. And the fact is that the world is changing faster than ever. And today is the slowest it's ever going to change again. And that cycle keeps accelerating. The question is in which direction? And I think that each of us, if you've got a keyboard, if you've got a device that's connected to a billion people, has a chance to speak up in a certain way. So I blogged every day for a lot of days in a row because it's a privilege. I don't get paid for it. I don't run ads on the blog. But the idea that you can share an idea and say, what do you think of this? Or I assert that and see how that contributes to the next thing. Why wouldn't you? He came so close to saying what I wanted him to say. And he sort of kind of got around it. And I don't know if he didn't say it directly because he's talking to another white man. But at the beginning of this interview, he said he was born in 1960 and he won the birth lottery. He didn't say he won the birth lottery because he is a cis het white man born in the 1960s. And so therefore was listened to and has been listened to with a lot more authority than maybe people who've had similar ideas, but looked different than him were. But he blogs every day and he says it's a privilege to and I wanted him to say it's because he makes enough money that he has the free time to be able to write every day. I really wish he would have said those things more directly, but let's continue. He told me that blogging every day is probably better than meditating every day, cold showers, <laughs> working out. You said that's probably one of the best things you can do as a personal practice I for do, anybody. I think that's true. I think everyone should blog every day, even if you do it under another name. Like I get that some people don't want to reveal their own self in this way. So great. Do or it under a pseudonym. Out? Well, it depends. I mean, we live in a world where um, people can show up uninvited in your email box. You don't have to welcome them into your email box. That's fine. But the act, you know, I don't blog every day because I have a, a new blog ready. I blog every day because it's tomorrow. And that idea that there's going to be something from me tomorrow on the blog challenges me today to think about what's the smartest, biggest, most generous contribution I can make tomorrow. And that pattern continues. And part of what we get stuck on is we say, uh, I don't feel like doing X, Y, or Z, so I don't do it. But the opposite is the way that habits are created. If you do something every day, then you will come to feel like doing it. So don't wait until you feel inspired or creative. That never works. I've never seen that that works. Exactly. From anybody. Right. It's all about discipline. Yeah. And um, what about people that say they have writer's block when they go to do that? Block? Yeah, I'm notorious for saying there's absolutely no such thing as writer's block. I mean, there's plenty of evidence to show that it was invented in the 1900s, that before then there wasn't even a term. And it came about partly um, because uh, 
Percy Shelley wrote a, a, a poem, short essay that said, how dare anyone think they could be a poet? That the only way you could become a poet is be touched by the muse. If you haven't been touched by the muse, you're out of luck, don't even try. And that got taken up by people who felt comfortable having writer's block. But then it became a term because suddenly writing could get you to be Ernest Hemingway. And you stare into that, the sunshine of that and you blink, you walk away. I'm, I'm just not in the mood, I don't have anything to say. But when I talk to people who say I don't have anything to say, when I talk to people who say they have writer's block, I say, show me your bad writing. Show me the stuff you've written that's no good. They don't have any. Right? I said, if you show me enough bad writing, I guarantee you some good writing will slip through. You can't help it. It will slip through. My friend Isaac Asimov wrote 400 books, published them in the old days when it was hard to publish that many books. And I said, does he really think it's easier to publish now? Now, instead of just being a good writer, publishing companies expect you to have a platform and followers and basically your own internal marketing engine to help you sell the book. I don't know. I kind of want to say, okay, boomer here. I said to him, how do you do this? And he said, every morning I get up and I go to the typewriter and from 6.30 to noon, I type. It doesn't matter what I type. I just have to keep typing. And what happened was his brain realized he was going to type anyway. You might as well type something good. I've been told that writer's block is when you put too much emphasis on what you're about to create as if it matters more than it does. And that stops you from doing it because you're worried about the judgment or how it's going to be. And you should just stop that and just write. Yeah, I think that's an interesting way to, to get a similar idea, which is that no one gets talker's block. No one gets walker's block. That if you are physically fit, you can do those things. But when it comes time to put it in print, you're saying, oh no, something big is about to happen here. And I guess what we're both saying is this discipline of going through the work of doing it. And when I say writing, I don't mean writing. I mean leading, connecting, inspiring, whatever it is you think is important begins with the word. It begins with what are you gonna say next? How are you going to bring this digital idea, even if you're speaking it, it's still digital, it's letters, to the next person so that it makes a difference to them. And what we've learned in the Alt MBA, so the, the way it works is uh, it's a cohort of 120 people and it lasts a month, two or three hours a day for a month around the world. And people come and they say, I'll never be able to keep up and I'll never be able to do this. And I'm not in it, there's no video of me, it's cohorts, video and writing, video conferencing and writing. And at the end of a month, they're transformed. Because if you write that much every for a month, if you give and get that kind of feedback, you can't bluff anymore. Because now you know you can do it because you did it, right? Okay, I wanna say a couple things here before, I think we're gonna move on to something else just based on what the camera is doing. It seems like a transition is coming. Complete aside, I think it's interesting that Seth Godin is kind of selling a course that he is not directly involved in, or doesn't seem like he's involved in, because he said he wasn't on video or anything as part of the course. So, okay. But I will say that I think writer's block is a thing. And just because something wasn't named until relatively recently, doesn't mean it wasn't a thing in the past. It just means we hadn't named it. Think of all those like old timey maladies that people had and how we look back at descriptions of them and think, oh, that was probably this thing, which we have a diagnosis and medication for. And probably if we would have been able to identify it back then and gotten that person intervention, they probably would have felt a lot better. Um, so I'm going to say that writer's block is a thing because there are some days where I'm not good at talking and like, I'm just not good at communicating my ideas generally, whether it's written form, video form, or some other form. The second, well, the third thing I will say, and this is something I've been learning about recently and thought I'll put you on to again, not an expert in this, but I've learned recently that men run on a 24 hour hormonal cycle, which means that while, you know, it takes some personal discipline to do something every single day. If you're a guy in your hormones are kind of changing at, at certain regular intervals throughout the day, you can probably plan something daily. That's going to work out for you a little bit easier. Women work on a 28 day hormonal cycle for obvious reasons. And um, what I find for myself and rather than fighting it, I've just gone with it, is that there is a few days a month where I am highly creative and I can be very productive. 
So I will plan out videos. Sometimes I'll film them. I will batch create content. I am just really good at that. And so while the content will be released on a regular interval, I am creating it at a time where I am feeling the most creative rather than fighting my hormonal cycle, because there are times where um, it probably wouldn't be impossible to create, but it would certainly be a lot harder. So I will find a few articles of, from people who know way more than I do about this, but I just want to mention that here, um, that part of the whole kind of pandemic shift, maybe for me and other people who are, you know, um, you know, assigned women at birth or who are neurodivergent is that we have been folding ourselves to fit into a workplace in a society that does not work for us energetically or otherwise. And so this whole daily practice thing, if that does work for you, great. But if it doesn't, like, I just, I want to say you're not the only one. You're not the only one. And, you know, the example he used of a guy who wrote for six hours every day, imagine that you had no interruptions from 6 a.m. to noon. Imagine your life where that was a possibility, where someone else took care of your kids or your, you know, household generally, where someone else answered the phone, where someone else is like helping you protect your time. And you could do that consistently without bad things happening to you. Imagine that privilege. But again, we're not talking of, we're mentioning privilege without acknowledging super directly our privilege. And um, like I said, I just wonder if a, I don't know, black woman was conducting this interview, if this conversation would be different. I, I'm so curious, but. Does a vlog count? Instead of a blog, like, can you put the camera on your? I agree. I think a blog, a vlog counts. I think any creative thing. If he's like, you should do a creative practice every day. If if a video is your thing, if an audio is your thing, I feel like whatever creative work it is, if a painting is your thing, I think it should count. But we'll see if Seth agrees with me. Self and talk to camera for five minutes, knowing you're going to have to publish it. Would that? I think it does, qualify? as long as you aren't talking about what you had for dinner. Okay. Right. I think that. There's this vanity thing that goes on on the internet that doesn't help anybody. And it's this faux authenticity of uh, eavesdropping on somebody else's life. And that's a fine way to entertain. I also want to say for this video, I know I tried recording a video at my office and the background noise didn't help. So I'm comfy here in my pajama bottoms and slippers in my apartment in normal location. If you're hearing a lot of traffic noise, that's actually them. That's not... That traffic noise is me, an occasional kind of truck going by, but I'm I'm in very rural traffic. We're hearing honking, we're hearing kind of a lot more city noises, and that's on their end. So I just wanted to mention that here. Uh, I don't think it's productive, but it, it works for entertainment purposes, but that's not scary. It's not scary to say, here I am walking my dog, ha, ha, ha. If it doesn't feel scary, then you haven't trained, you haven't moved forward. Okay. So that writing could be a blog or it could be some type of leadership or writing a proposal to someone, but get and write something, which means you're creating something, which could be judged, which means also it could be great. Okay. Seth Godin talks about writing stuff that feels scary or vulnerable. Okay. Not faux, not faux vulnerability, but actual vulnerability. I want to read one of his blog posts. It's pretty short. Okay. And tell me if this feels like vulnerable or, or, raw or very risky to you to write. So the title is speeding up for the red light. And this is the content. Bad drivers do this often everywhere I've ever been in the world. Instead of gracefully and safely slowing for a light, they know they will be red by the time they get there or even a stop sign. They hit the gas and then slam the brakes. One big reason is that the certainty of the on then off is a lot easier for them to navigate than a thoughtful approach to transitions. If you're going to have to stop soon, perhaps you should start coasting now. And of course, we all make the br breaking mistake in our daily lives. A transition doesn't have to be a crisis unless we want it to be. So that's, I would say, pretty characteristic of his blog. Okay, did that piece I just read for you, did that feel like risky? Or did that feel like somebody would have a very strong opinion about that piece one way or the other? Because it didn't feel vulnerable to me. And when I read his blog, it's a lot of general platitudes or general stories like that. 
that don't feel vulnerable to me. I don't know. Anybody else? I feel like it's one of those things where like, I'm just maybe missing something. But exactly. And it could change the world and help other people. Exactly. Which I know one of your, the people you looked up to was Zig Ziglar, who said, I, I'm probably going to totally bludgeon this, but if you want to have a meaningful life, make life meaningful for other people. Is that right? I even like that better than what Zig said. <laughs> okay. I like that a lot better. Zig said, you can get anything in life you want if you'll help enough other people get what they want. I've always thought that Zig Ziglar quote was kind of manipulative. You can get everything in life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. It sounds, it makes relationships sound transactional. And I also don't think, by the way, I've had tens of thousands of people read my blog, okay? I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not a household name, I never will be, but I do not think one of my blogs has changed anyone's life. I feel like probably somebody saw my stuff and felt maybe encouraged or thought it was funny, but like this whole like one blog post could change someone's life implying that and then wondering why people have writer's block or worry about what they're putting out there is like, it's hard to hold those two things at the same time. At least it is for me. And my challenge with that is the quid pro quo part, right? That because he came from a sales background, implied in that is, well, I'm your insurance broker. And if I help you get a golf game, you'll buy insurance from me. And that doesn't work for me. And so I truncated it to you can get everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people. Right. Period. Period. Right. That that's enough. Just the privilege of being of service. And I like the fact that you added meaning to it. It's really good. Okay. Okay. I agree with Seth Godin there. Because it can't have a contingency, otherwise it taints right. the original product. Exactly. You have to literally be willing to selflessly give, not expecting anything back, you know, no payment, no congratulations even, just give it. And that's when it becomes its, its best form, I think. Right, exactly. You know, with all the people connected in the world that can blog or create, are you, do you feel optimistic about what we're going? Or is it, is it look harder these days because there's also an equal number of messages that are, you know, vanity and narcissistic? How do you so how people who are established in their industry answer the, the questions, you know, so if you were getting into this now, do you think it would be harder or easier, which is sort of the question that was being asked. Um, and if you ask them the follow up question are, is there people who are doing things marketing wise that you admire, like who are just kind of getting started? I think the answer to those kind of two related questions will tell you a lot about somebody. And I'll be curious what they tell us about Seth here. How do you feel right now about the world? Well, there are really big discussions to have about, you know, what's the mean temperature of the ocean. And I think we, almost everybody is minimizing the impact it's going to have when a billion people lose their homes. But that wasn't the question. Uh, the idea of the media ecosystem and all the noise that's out there, and what happens when you give everyone a microphone. You know, Steve Martin famously said that uh, half the people are below average. And it doesn't matter what you're measuring, they are. And the idea that we used to have a gatekeeper for who got a microphone was good and bad. It was bad because it silenced voices we needed to hear. But it was good because it also kept microphones away from people who wanted to tear things down. Really? Are we pro gatekeeper here? So this pisses me off. Because the implication here with what Seth is saying is that the people who are gatekeepers had the skill and the talent, and that's why they got to where they were getting versus them having, I don't know, a father in the business or an extreme amount of privilege, right? And for me, I was told in my early 20s that I was not good, a good enough writer to write for a newspaper. And if I would have listened to that gatekeeper... I would not be here and I have literally been paid by hundreds of clients to write things for them because I'm good at it. So the assessment of one middle-aged guy could have, if I would have let it, disrupted my entire career. So no, I don't think gatekeepers are a good thing. I think everybody puts stuff out there and the public or people decide who's talented I can decide who I want to listen to and who I don't want to listen to. And if someone wants to tear something down, maybe it wasn't that good to begin with. Your privilege is showing. 
when I think about what is on offer from the social media networks, it's really important to decode this. You are not their customer. You are their product. You did not pay them to use Twitter or Facebook. They are selling you to someone else. So they've created a regime where they make us feel bad all day long. And the only way to feel less bad is to click something. That's the cycle that they've built. And the problem with that cycle and the easily measured number of how many followers you have is it pushes people to be prurient, pushes people to be angry, it pushes people to tear folks down because that's what sells. If it bleeds, it leads, right? But it doesn't build a culture that we're proud of. I've sat in news meetings where we talked about how many papers we sold one week versus another and compared the front page and talked about the image that was there versus the headline. We have always cared about numbers. We have always sold controversy. The fact that it's online now and that there is more of it does not mean it wasn't a problem before. Okay. Okay. And the alternative is to say, I don't care how many people are following me and I'm never going to hit the boost button because my job is not to make Facebook happy, nor is it to make Twitter happy. My job is to create a body of work that I'm proud of. And if we can embrace the idea of a smallest viable audience, not the biggest possible audience, but what's the audience that could sustain you? So London Real has grown dramatically in eight years and almost no one in the world knows who you are. 99.9% of the people on the planet have never heard of you, have never seen one of your videos, and that's okay. And getting comfortable with that is the foundation we need to do our work. Because otherwise, you're going to start chasing a Kardashian. I love the look on the guy's face when he was like, when Seth Godin was like, a bunch of people have never even heard of you, and they banned to the guy's face. It was great. <laughs> but I once wrote a blog post about why I think you only need 250 fans. I I'll link it in the show notes in case you want to read it. It was written a long time ago, but I think it's still true. And the problem with that is we have a Kardashian already. We don't need another one of those. What we need is one of these. And the way to be one of these is to say 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, it would be enough. And once you can get comfortable with enough in a world of infinity, it doesn't really matter how noisy it is. And you talk about this in your book, Tribe, um, about focusing on that, that small audience. And Kevin Kelly has the famous blog, Thousand True Fans. We've had right. him on the show. And I try to teach my students this as well in the academy. And when I, I do it, we have a big Zoom call and their faces go blank. And yep. I said, you got to find a micro niche. And I'm going to push you to go more micro. Yep. Two more levels than you're going to want to. Exactly. And this guy hasn't gone micro. He's just inter he's interviewing a bunch of thought leaders. What's his micro niche? So it's like they're saying don't care about fans or whatever. But the reason that I'm able to sell you a course, able to sell you a book, able to sell you anything is because I have a lot of fans. But don't don't care about don't care about that. Care about this other thing. I don't know. They have to understand why people would want that, right? Why people would want a large audience, how it makes a lot of things possible. And they have the flexibility to say, well, they, they don't care about a large audience because they both have large audiences. And uh, they never want to. Because, you know why they don't want to? Because <laughs> I think they believe that the bigger the audience, the more successful they'll be. But there's probably something more subtle. I think there's something more subtle. What, what is it? I think we don't want to be on the hook. On the hook. Meaning if there's only three people in the world you're making this for and they don't like it, you're toast, <laughs> Got it. right? That this whole idea of Kanban, that making the supply chain really thin, making sure that the quality of each piece is just right for those three people makes it a much bigger obligation on your part. Whereas if it's a million people, you're like, whatever. Fine, you didn't like it? Go ahead, I got others, plenty of them. And that shift, that's where it becomes magical. Mm -hmm. And if you name any artist who has stood the test of time in whatever field, that is what they did. What they did is worried about a few and ignored, shunned the non-believers. So it's the accountability that actually. Can we have an actual example of this? Because I feel like the kind of people I can think of are people who make like custom furniture or something like that, who make something very specific for a specific group of people. He's saying the most successful people have ignored the masses and created for the few. I would like an example. I don't think it would be much to ask here for an example. It makes you show up. Exactly. The smaller the group, the more accountability. 
because you can see the faces. Right. As opposed to this, this mask. Right. How right. dare you not know what I wanted? Right. Because right? there's only three of us. Right. Right. So you have to force yourself to be in the honking is on their end. Front of your ultimate clients, users, people. Exactly. And, and stare at them and look so at them. So I, six years ago, I took the decision not to try to get any new readers for my blog, not to try to get any new readers for my books. I have enough. That's fine. Thank you a million for my blog. That's all I need. Two million would not make my work better. It would not make my work more important. But he got to a million. We're supposed to care about three people, but he's decided to only stop caring after a million. Just putting that out there. It would not make my writing better. What it would do is require me to do things like listicles and have plenty of arguments and things like that. That would get me more readers. Not my job, not my goal. My goal is how can I serve this group? It's enough. Would you have to dilute your brand by definition to have more, more followers? Like well, dil dilute is a tricky word and so yeah. is brand. So okay. let's decode them a little bit. Okay. Brand is not logo. Brand is the expectation that people have when you walk into the room or when they buy your product. If Nike had a hotel, I think we could guess what it would be like. If Hyatt had a brand of sneakers, we'd have no idea what they would be like. Hyatt doesn't have a brand. They just have a logo. Whereas Nike, they have a brand. Now, Diluting it, Nike is known by everyone on the planet because they didn't have to dilute it to be what they are, which is this sort of golden aura of effort, right? Whereas I'm a lot more particular and peculiar than that. And so I would have to maybe condense it, refine it to be something a lot more symbolic than what I am. But I prefer to be the, the guy with enough obscure little bits around it that I'm doing the work I want to do as opposed to looking in the rear view mirror and saying, what would get me the next zero of audience? So he threw out a term here and I just want to define it. He says, oh, I'd have to do listicles. So a listicle is a list article made famous by BuzzFeed. I'll put a couple of examples of titles on the screen and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the listicle format. I think it can communicate information succinctly. I think it can make a headline a bit shareable so people kind of know what they're getting into. Um, yeah, I think that some of these highbrow writers are like, ooh, a listicle. But people want to read them. They're easy to share. Let's not poo-poo them as a format. You mentioned your alt MBA. What have you learned doing that? What were you wrong about? What were you right about? What surprised you? So uh, I was surprised after we ran the first one as an experiment. The goal was the typical online course has a 97% dropout rate. And I said, if this is the future of learning, that's not going to be acceptable. What would I change to fix that? And I did the opposite of every other online course in like six different areas at like no video of me and you have to apply to get in and it's not free and this and this. And we have a 97% completion rate and a 3% dropout rate, which is really great. So after the first one, which was an experiment, I said, I'm really surprised. I got a lot of these pieces right. We should do it again. And now we're on our 38th session because it's working. The thing that has surprised me by far is how people talk themselves out of applying to it that the logic and the rationale and the excuses, they run so deep. Because if you go to Harvard Business School or Stanford, where I went, you can tell everybody what you did. And it costs $250,000 in tuition and opportunity costs, and it's worth it because you get to tell other people what you did. And that's really what you're buying. And this, which costs 1 60th the amount of money, it's hard to tell other people because we intentionally made it hard to talk about. What, what exactly is it? We're okay, he said it costs 1 60th and I, I couldn't do 1 60th of 250,000 apparently. I just looked it up. The cost of the alt MBA tuition is $4,450 for the four week intensive. So just, uh, just as a little FYI as we continue to watch this. Where's the curriculum? Where's all the proof? Where's the accreditation? We don't have any of those things. And because it's hard to talk about, you have to talk about it to yourself. And in that moment, you feel on the hook and you feel insufficiency. And 
that runs super deep with people. How do we get folks to trust themselves? And this is something you deal with all the time, which is it's not about more tactics. Is it about trusting yourself or is it about saying spending 4,500 bucks in four intense weeks was a worthwhile thing for me to do? I don't think it's trusting yourself. I think it's trusting the cost of uh, money and personal time for what I will get out of it. That the internet has become this sort of laundry list of, oh yeah, I read that blog post, only a paragraph of it, and I did this, and it's, so why aren't I already successful? We have all the tactics we need. People have access to way more of this information than ever before, and yet we're not creating better work because it was never important to know that stuff. What was important is to believe that you have something to contribute. Right? Are we really saying that there isn't better work out there now than there was 10 years ago on the internet? Because if, if that's what they're saying, I disagree. I think, I think there is better work coming out. I mean, I think there's more work coming out, which is to say that some of it's not going to be fantastic. But I have seen some truly clever and uh, well-presented and interesting and thoughtful communications online more so than I've seen ever. So I disagree. Right. And to get someone to walk into that fearful moment. Correct. And these days at a distance without a personal meeting. Um, have you found ways of getting people to do that? Because I mean, that's the essence of what I do in my academy. I often say, Seth Godin, how do you get people to pay for your academy? Because I want to steal some of those secrets and get people to come to mine. I have many guises of courses, public speaking, broadcasting, business. But at the end of the day, I push people into their fears to realize right. they're stronger than they are and they have a voice and they walk out with confidence. Right. So the marketer in me who started to learn marketing from Jay Levinson and all the rest of my heroes years and years and years ago wants there to be a top-down funnel. And in fact, there isn't. That the stuff I wrote about 10 books ago is the answer, which is the only way we're going to get more students is, is if our students get us more students. That it's the peer-to-peer -peer connection in a low-trust world that leads culture to change. You don't change culture with the Super Bowl. Whether it's a Super Bowl ad or a Super Bowl halftime show, it has no impact whatsoever. But if one person in your neighborhood is driving a Tesla, the chances that their next door neighbor are gonna think about driving a Tesla go up by a factor of 100, peer to peer. So all we do, and we have a tiny team, seven or eight people plus 100 coaches around the world. All we do is say, this group of 120 people, how much can we help them? How can we transform them? Because if we do, they will tell the others. It's this. You said 150 people? Is that what he said? 150 people times $4,500. $675,000. I could say that would support a staff of eight and 100 instructors. Uh, 1099 contractors, yeah. The slow, organic thing that is way more frustrating than raising $100 million and blowing it on Super Bowl ads. But it's actually how you change the culture. Make a great product, deliver wow, and then wait for them to tell other people. And they will only tell other people if it helps them. They will not tell other people because it helps you. And that's a really big transformation. So the fax machine. The first person who had a fax, what did they do with it? Because you can't send a fax to yourself because you'll get a busy signal. What you have to do is tell everyone you know to go get a fax machine because then your life will be better. You don't do it to help Rico or Canon. You do it because your life is better if other people you work with have a fax or an email account or whatever. Or in the case of Tony Robbins, if you work with influencers and pay a hefty commission fee for them to get people to sign up for your personal development events through their affiliate link. That's another way to do it. Well, the same thing is true with these kinds of transformations, which is if I want to be able to talk to you the way I learned to talk, I need you to go do it too, because otherwise I, you won't get where I'm going. So it's that selfish ratchet that's also generous because I want to help my friend. That's why people talk about it. And so sometimes people who make a product that they think of as perfect, 
right? Like, you know, if someone makes a coffee mug that's better designed than any other coffee mug that has six sigma qualities, say, why isn't anyone talking about it? Well, the reason they're not talking about it is it doesn't help them to talk about your damn coffee mug, right? And if there was a reason that I needed to talk about your coffee mug because it would help my status, authority, or life, I'd be more likely to do it. Hmm. And so you're all MBA, ideally it's someone in a business that takes it and then says, wow, if my colleagues only could think this way, we could get a lot more done. Or is it also if my wife could think this way? Or you know, like, how does that spread right. in the ideal world for so, you? So the range has been a 16 year old young woman, a 78 year old woman from the Isle of Man, um, people who are poets and run nonprofits, people who work at Amazon, Microsoft, Chobani, uh, name your favorite computer company or big company and everything in between. So we, we called it the Alt MBA because I had a good six letter domain hanging around and I used it. Not the perfect name because of the Alt part and the MBA part, but when you mix it all together, at least it's something that's ours. But we don't teach anything you learn in an Alt MBA. That's in, a, in an MBA, that's the point. That the point is, that the MBA teaches all of the wrong things. It teaches industrial compliance. It teaches adherence to things that you can read in a book. And what we're trying to do is say to people, you don't need any more tactics. We just want you to think differently. And we have found our, probably our biggest resonance, 45% of people who take it get reimbursed by their company. But the people who go through it write to us, they're better parents, they're better spouses, they're better executives, they got promoted, whatever it is that was on their agenda. And a lot of them changed their agenda. They thought, I wanted to move up in this hierarchy, but I realized that's a trap and I'm gonna do this thing instead. So it's really disruptive at changing your perception of what you even want. And so I'm not gonna pigeonhole it by demographics. We're really focused on psychographics. What almost everyone who takes it has in common is they say to themselves, there has to be more to it than this, whatever it is. There has to be more to life, more to work, more to my job, more to my company than what I have right now. If that's what you feel inside, this is for you. If you don't feel that way, I can't help. But a lot of people are feeling that way. I think so. And maybe that comes from the you know industrial education complex. Maybe that comes from the self-help industrial complex that is rampant on social media. Mm -hmm the television education uh, industrial complex, which I want to talk about. You went to Stanford for an MBA. Right. Was there, what did you get from that? What did you not get from that? So <laughs> you um, road tested one of the best. Yeah. It, I was the second or third youngest person in my class. And the third day that I got there, I was really underwater, not because I couldn't do the work, but because my peers weren't hesitant to remind me that I hadn't worked in an investment bank. I hadn't worked at a commercial bank. I hadn't paid the price they had paid. And in order to make themselves feel like that price was worth it, they were making me feel insufficient. Mm. And a guy named Chip Connolly, who was my age, put a yeah. little note in my mailbox. Okay. And he did it to three other people. And he said, Tuesdays at 7 p.m., we're gonna meet in the anthropology department. Would you like to join our little group? And there were five of us. We met there every single Tuesday for the first, year. And we just brainstormed entrepreneurial ideas. We came up with thousands of them in that room. That was the biggest thing I got out of business school. Being seen by Chip, being part of that circle. Really? You got an MBA from one of the best schools in the country. And you don't think that got you into any of any room you wouldn't have gotten into. Otherwise, you don't think that got you connections that you wouldn't be able to make otherwise. You don't think that got you jobs you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Come on. Realizing that I had something to contribute was magical. And the second thing I got out of business school was the summer job that I got, which I couldn't have gotten without it. And that was in Boston. And the story of that is that I got a job at, for the summer as the assistant to the president of Activision in California. Fastest growing company in the history of the world assistant to the president. Activision, gaming yeah. company. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they were on a roller coaster ride. It was amazing. And at the last minute, I found out I couldn't stay in California. I had to get back to Boston to be uh, with my family. And so I only had four weeks to find a job. And I almost got a job offer from Lotus to people who invented this, the PC spreadsheet. I almost got a job at uh, 
Hayden software, the people who did Sarga and the chess program. They, however, interviewed me at the International House of Pancakes and turned me down. So then there were two possibilities left. One was Parker Brothers, and I'm a gaming guy and have been forever. Parker Brothers offered me a job in their computer game division, which was thrilling. It was Parker Brothers. And then I got a job offer from a little tiny company called Spinnaker. I was the 30th person, and they were inventing educational computer games, which didn't exist at the time. And I don't know why I turned down the Parker Brothers job. Something inside of me just said, don't do that. And two weeks into the summer, Parker Brothers shut down the entire division and fired every single person. Mm. So dodge that bullet. And I get to Spinnaker, and it turns out the chairman who had hired me forgot to tell anyone else in the company that I was coming. So the president comes out, shakes my hand, goes back into his office, shuts the door, and calls the chairman and says, who's that guy? So off to a rough start. But during that summer, I learned how to be a product manager. And at the end of the summer, they took me aside and they said, we have a secret project, but it's going to start right now. Are you willing to go to business school and this at the same time? So I went to class at Stanford on Monday and Tuesday, flew on the red eye, went to work in Boston for Wednesday and Thursday, and then flew back to California. And finally, one of the professors at Stanford took pity on me and just gave me a degree and I never went back again, which was super nice. But that job, that job changed everything for me. And I think of it almost every day. What okay, so he wouldn't have gotten that job without Stanford. And they paid for him to go to Stanford, maybe as well, to finish his MBA. I don't, I don't quite know there, but the only two things I got out of it were th was this connection that made me feel worthwhile and the job that changed my life. That's all I got out of it. You know, no biggie. What did What did you learn doing that? I learned uh, mostly that there wasn't anyone who was going to teach me to be a marketer or a brand manager or a uh, negotiator or someone who was going to deal with uh, leading a team of engineers. I ended up having 40 people working for me, even though none of them were direct reports. I worked with Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and Michael Crichton, who I, like Michael, I just called and did a deal with him. I was 24 years old, but no one was stopping me. So I just did. And this was practice for the internet. Because what it showed me was that, yes, I had the backing. It wasn't my money on the table, but that I was able to weave together things, products that people love. We shipped Fahrenheit 451 based on Ray Bradbury's novel. It was a computer game. And uh, two days after we shipped it, I get a call in my office because there's no email. And it's Herbie Hancock like the Herbie Hancock. And he says, man, I just want to tell you, I just finished the game. It was fan. I was like, wait, 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 wait. What just happened here? And then I was hooked. Then I was hooked. Hooked on creating products. Creating something for people that would transform them once they engage with it. Okay. Yeah. Is it true that every one of your books comes from a lesson you learned in your life or one of these experiences you had in, in a corporation or on your own? I mean, I would say that most of what I write and teach, I do because I wish someone had taught it to me a long time ago. That if I, what I do for a living is I notice things. Why is it like this? Like why in New York City do you have to show a driver's license to get into an office building? How is showing a driver's license, it's bad guys don't have driver's licenses. If someone is going to infiltrate an office building and do an evil deed, how will a driver's license keep them from doing that? Right? And I notice this and some people notice this and they get frustrated. I try to decode it. And sometimes if I decode something, and it feels more universal than just the noise in my head, I'll share it. Because once it's seen, then you can work with it. And I like when I learn something about how the world works from someone else, because it helps me get through a situation because I understand it better. And Again, I would love an example of somebody he's learned from and how he's incorporated what he learned into his worldview. I feel like he talks sometimes like other people are sort of involved in his learning or that he's, you know, I know that he's an observer of the world, but that also the implication is that he's kind of a collector of information from talking to other people or from reading books or something. I don't know. I feel like an example here would be, would be helpful and kind of show how maybe other people could um, incorporate that kind of learning from other people into their own lives. And so with every book that I've written, what I'm saying is I'm noticing this thing in the world 
And here's how I think it works. And here's how I think it might help you make things better. Maybe it's worth 20 bucks for you to find out. Mm. Super Bowl, we just saw a lot of money spent on those ads. Is that all a waste in your mind? Well, it depends on what you're measuring, what you're after. Intentional action is who's it for and what's it for. So if you sell beer or chips, it has been shown that at halftime, you make enough money from sales at convenience stores to pay for the ad you ran during the first quarter. So in that way, for sure, that works. But maybe who it's for is to make people on Wall Street think your company is real. Maybe who it's for is to make the boss know that the CMO's office is doing something. Maybe what it's for is to bring in your best clients to wherever the Super Bowl is being held because you get to have a box. So it's for a lot of things. But if the question is, does it sell more cars or does it sell more anything? The answer is no. And the reason is really simple, which is this. Advertising works better when it's specific. Meaning, advertising cars to people who don't know how to do that, that sirens them. I had a siren go by a while ago. I tried to mute myself, but this video has a lot more background noise, but I guess they did say it was filmed in New York City and I am not in New York City, so. Drive is a waste of money. Advertising chips to people who don't eat chips is a waste of money. That's one of the reasons why Facebook is so profitable because you can reach exactly who you want, psychographically or demographically. Why would you pay a premium to reach everyone? You should pay less to reach everyone because everyone is worth less then someone. And so the thinking of advertising needs to be who's in the emotional state, demographically, psychographically, emotionally ready to move that I could put an ad in front of. Now, what they know at Mercedes is that they have to run $1,000 worth of ads to sell one Mercedes, and it's worth it to them. They don't know which one of those $1,000 worth of ads is going to reach the right person on the right day, so they got to run all the other ones too. But it doesn't make sense to run Mercedes ads in a country where they don't sell Mercedes because you're never going to get anyone. So being this is a lot like um, I'll link the Gary V video that I reacted to um, in the show notes. But um, there's a lot of similarities here between what Seth Godin is talking about and what Gary V was talking about in that video. Specific, again, as we said a little while ago, is really scary because if you pick your audience and you're wrong, that's on you. The Super Bowl, way less scary. It's not your money. Let's reach everyone. And guess what? We'll get to sit in the box. When you look at the Fortune 500 companies, how many of those get it right when it comes to their marketing or advertising? You mentioned Mercedes. Right. So Fortune 500 companies are basically nation states that the people who run them are royalty. They have their own army and air force. They are surrounded by lieutenants and you know there's a court and the whole thing. You got to be really incompetent to screw up a Fortune 500 company in the short run. In the short run, the market wants a boring product that's proven in the center at a reasonable price because it's deniable. Oh, I bought what everyone else bought. So, And also in that kind of company, you have a lot of people around you who have expertise and institutional knowledge who can help be guiding your decisions. So yeah, I could see that. The history, almost none of the Fortune 500 is the same as it was in 1950. They get replaced. Why? Because they keep doing what they were doing because that's what they're getting paid to do until the world changes. It's the innovator's dilemma. Exactly. This is the innovator's dilemma. Okay. Clayton, rest in peace. Right. And, um, and so then they disappear. But along the way, until recently, that was fine because you could retire before that happened. So I worked with Kodak years ago. And uh, a friend of mine did a lot of consulting for them. And the, the Kodak, most people know, invented the digital camera as well and owned all the patents. And as film was dying, Kodak was just churning into film as hard as they can. And my friend said to the CEO, you're going to have to scale back the film thing. And he said to her, come over here, look out the window. He says, how many buildings do you see out there? And she started counting. He said, I'll tell you, it's 38. He said, now another question. How many processes are involved? in making film? The answer is 38. There was one building for each one of the processes necessary for Kodak to make film. They were optimized to do one thing. And as a result, you couldn't slowly scale back film because you couldn't close any of the 38 buildings. You needed all of them. They were 
a dinosaur, but dinosaurs were really good at eating plants in large volume until the asteroid hit. And the same thing is true for most Fortune 500 companies. So most of you know, the average CMO at a Fortune 500 company lasts 18 months. And the reason they last 18 months is because it takes five months for them to make promises, a year for them to have a grace period, and then a month for the CEO to realize the promises aren't going to get kept and they get replaced again. Because unlike every other department at the company, the CMO promises to change everything. The CMO promises miracles. Accounting never promises miracles. Production doesn't, right? Yeah. But, but marketing does. And so they're hiring the... So I've never been the CEO of anything or worked at a big company. But I have had multiple business owners sit across the table from me crying, hoping that the marketing that I am going to do is going to save their business. I'm not sure if we necessarily, I don't know if the CMOs make promises. I mean, they might. But what I'm also wondering is, does the company expect the most from marketing? When things are going bad, do we look to marketing and say, okay, more marketing is going to save us or better marketing is going to save us? It's just, I'm just asking because like I said, I have had people who really think that the Facebook and Instagram and the email marketing I could do for them or whatever group of things it is, is going to save their entire business when the business has been downtrending for literally years. And I don't think it's a fair ask. And I'm always really um, kind, but straightforward with them about what, what can and can't be expected from the work that we're going to do. And sometimes if I think it's going to be a waste of their money and they should do other things instead, I, I will say that. So for, for what it's worth, yeah, they might make promises at big companies. I can't say that, but I will say marketing is the first thing that's cut when things aren't going well as like dead weight. And it is the place that people look to when everything has gone to crap. Well, maybe we can sell more. I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's a uh, it's a weird position to be in. The wrong people for the wrong reason. If you want a miracle, you're not going to change it by changing your ads. You're going to get the miracle by closing 19 of the 38 buildings. You're going to get the miracle by changing who you hire and how you. Exactly. Yeah. Usually, if someone's sitting with me talking about honey, they want to change marketing. They often need to like change their pricing or you know, put money into their building because it's like run down and giving people a bad experience or it's usually something big. And it's usually something that I as the marketing person have no control over. You hire them. Those are marketing acts. You just don't call them marketing. And that will never happen in a Fortune 500 company because you can't turn that ship. Innovators Dilemma. It's well, can interesting. it happen every now and then? Every now and then it has happened and it can happen. We certainly saw Satya do it at Microsoft. It's happened at Microsoft a couple of times. It, uh, Apple did it right up to the edge of bankruptcy right. once, right? That Nintendo wasn't a Fortune 500 company, but they made playing cards and then they didn't. So it can be done. But the thing is, humans shouldn't care that much about the name on the door. We need to care about the people. Okay. I just need you to know the sirens are, are on their end and I can't control it. And so if the place you're at isn't working anymore, just leave and go to a place that is working because there's nothing keeping you there. The momentum, the sunk costs should be ignored. And you should say, I'm only gonna get tomorrow one time. If I have tomorrow to do over again, how will I do? You mentioned intentional action. Right. It's something you talk to people a lot, that it's the actions that matter, not the thoughts and not the, the dreams. Can you explain that to people? Well, we're, we're scared of intent because if you s announce your intent, even to yourself, it makes it way more likely you're gonna fail. Right? So we go into the store and someone says, can I help you? you say, I'm just looking. I'm just looking is a statement of no intent. And that's the way many people have been trained to go through life because the system wants you to have no intent. It wants you to do your job, get paid, buy stuff, put it in a storage unit, watch TV, repeat, no intent. And as soon as we start having intent, we hesitate because who are we to do it? So I'm currently reading the 48 laws of power now and Part of the reason is that I am curious about a book that was banned in certain prisons and other places. But the main reason I'm doing it is that I am seeing that my work is taking me to larger clients and organizations 
I'm sitting in rooms with like bigger business people. And I want to understand a little bit more of what might be going on because my brain honestly doesn't work that way. I'm a kind of straightforward person, which you've probably figured out from watching this channel. But law number three is conceal your intentions, which is the opposite of what Seth Godin is saying to do here. Hide your intentions, not by closing up with the risk of appearing secretive or making people suspicious, but by talking endlessly about your desires and goals, just not your real ones. So there are some reasons to do that, but obviously I'm, I'm still reading the book, so I, I won't get into this. As he was saying that, I thought, wait a minute, that seems like the opposite of what I've been reading. And, and I just checked and it is. I feel like an imposter when we have intent. But if you can announce your intent, then you can get to who exactly are you seeking to change? What change exactly are you seeking to make? Wait a minute. Who are we seeking to change? I'm sorry. Can we change anybody but ourselves? I mean, I might be able to train my dog for a new trick, but like, really? Like we we think we can actively change other people? Oh, oh man. I think anybody who's ever been in a relationship can agree that uh, you can't change anyone unless they want to change. Who has intent? Surgeons. If you go to a surgeon, she doesn't just accidentally cut you open. She says, you have a blocked vein or... Oh my God, Seth, thank you for using she as an example for a surgeon. If you knew how rare that was. Or whatever, I'm going to go in there and fix it. Intent. It either works or it doesn't work. And that action, whether we work for a company or as on our own, can fuel us doing ever better work. Because we can say, I set out to do this, and it either worked, and I'm sorry it did, or it worked, and I'm glad it did, or I could have done it better, and here's how. And how do you set intentions? Is it goals? Is it values? Is it a mission? For, for me personally? Yeah, and for anyone out there who wants to do it. Well, I think that all of us have no place to begin but with ourselves. What turns us on? What gives us a smile? What would... Uh, make our late parents happy? What do what would happen to our status with our neighbors and our role in the community if X, Y, or Z happened? So, okay, making dead people happy and doing things to elevate our status. Yeah, that doesn't at all sound like a fool's errand. We always begin there. Even the most selfless person on earth, you know, you're diving in to a, a, a shark infested waters to save someone's life. Well, Yes, saving their life is important, but part of the reason it's important is you want to be the kind of person that would have do done that act and saved that person's life. Being that kind of person is better than walking away and watching them drown. So that's where we begin, which is getting clear in our head about what are the shifts we seek to make to become the person we want to be. And then there's a, a series of choices we have to make, but I think they're easier if we have habits. Habits get us results. Goals are results. But you can't, having the goal of I'm going to make a number one bestseller, what do you, that didn't tell me anything. Whereas having the goal of I'm going to write every single day and I'm going to learn this and this, and maybe the byproduct is that there's a bestseller at the end. Those are different things. So I'm way more focused on habits than I am on specific goals that are out of your control. Besides your daily writing, what are some of the other habits you've adopted over the years? Um, I ask why a lot. Uh, I have rules for myself that I make once and then I don't negotiate them again. So I haven't had a piece of meat or chicken since 1980 something because I just don't want to keep revisiting the question, right? I made a good. So I am famous for researching something, thinking about something, making a decision and not revisiting it. But sometimes you have to, and I'll use a per, I'll use an example in the company. Um, I've used MailChimp since it came out. I don't know what number customer I was, but I was one of the first ones 14 years ago, 13 years ago. And since they got bought by Intuit, the product just has gotten worse and harder to deal with. So we're moving our email marketing to SendGrid right now, and we're running a test. We're probably going to move everything to SendGrid within two months, but I'm going from paying $80 to, for a product I don't like to $14 for 
a product that I like a lot better. So sometimes new things come on the market, new information comes into your brain and you have to accommodate it. So while we can admire somebody who sticks to a decision, we can also say that having this be a consistent value for you and not revisiting things when you should and changing the decision might limit you personally and professionally. Good decision. The decision has served me well. I'm done with that decision. I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, the habit of ignoring sunk costs, which is really hard, which is to say, it doesn't matter how much it took me to get to X. If I don't want X anymore, I shouldn't keep with that. I agree with that. Um, the idea of not having a meeting. I don't have meetings. Uh, I will have one-on-one -on -one conversations all the time. But it's very hard to persuade me to sit in a room with three or four or six people as we go around the room and do X, Y, or Z. Send me a memo, put it in Slack. I don't need to do that. And as a result of no TV and no memos, I have six or seven hours every day that most people don't have. To continue watching the rest of the episode for free, visit our website, londonreal.tv, or click the link in the description below. Ooh, tricky London Real. I see what you did there. So as we've established at the beginning of this broadcast, I am in no way a Seth Godin fangirl. I own two of his books. I've read his blog a few times that people have sent me. And I'm just kind of like, okay, I mean, I can see how the idea of permission marketing and all that could be sort of either revolutionary or a way to think about something differently for some people. But I guess since that's how I naturally think of things, I, I don't need a lot of reinforcement from him in that way. And I think his blog entries are pretty general, even though he acts like they're very vulnerable. Like, I don't know, they seem like chicken soup for the marketing soul to me. But anyway, um, watching this interview and then, you know, doing the math, I see that Seth Godin is a 61 year old uh, white cis het man who has, who made his fortune in .com and who has had a lot of privileges and honestly, a lot of them did show in this interview for me anyway. But let's talk a little bit about what we learned, which I think honestly is more valid than a lot of the videos that I've reacted to. So number one, marketing is not hype. Marketing is when culture changes for the better, when, when something changes culture for the better. Number two, blog every day and be vulnerable, even if you have to do it under a pseudonym. Think about blogging as what you're going to say that's important for tomorrow, because you write your blogging for the next day. Don't wait to get inspired or creative, because there is no such thing as writer's block. Number four, a small but engaged audience is better, even though Seth Godin stopped thinking about growing his audience once he hit one million. Brand is an expectation, and that was where the Hyatt Nike example was used, which I thought was good. Number six, peer-to-peer -peer connection has more impact than any kind of marketing or advertising that you can do. Number seven, people will only tell other people about your product or service if it helps them. And we can say helps them from a wow, this thing was really amazing and helped me way, or this is going to help me because if I sell it, I'm going to make money in an affiliate way. Number eight, uh, we need to communicate our intention and outcomes. Number nine, habits get us results. Uh, goals are mostly, can be for the most part out of our control, but our habits are not. Number 10, we need to ignore sunk costs because if we don't want it anymore, it doesn't matter. And number 11, one-to-one uh, -one conversations are the most important kind of conversations we can have and meetings can be a waste of time. So one of the most valuable things I do is a meeting that Seth Godin wouldn't have. And it's a, basically, I call it the company retreat. We've done it every year once I realized that they were a thing. Um, we skipped 2020 because honestly, I was just trying to figure out how we were going to keep going in 2020. But uh, we did it virtually last year. I'm sure we'll probably end up doing it virtually again. But um, we sit down for half a day as a company. Everyone obviously is paid for their time. I'm not a monster. I send everyone money so that they can get lunch takeout. 
and we talk about what's going well, what isn't going well, what we want to change. And I brief on upcoming projects. And sometimes if time allows, we'll do some kind of training where everybody goes around and teaches how to do something, which is kind of fun. And that use of time not only allows me to talk to everyone, which I do on a regular basis anyway, but allows the team to talk to each other a little bit differently than they normally do and gives them a level of comfort in, okay, now that I've met so-and-so, I feel comfortable reaching out to them. Or now that we've had this conversation on the side, like, you know, they feel more comfortable working together or giving each other feedback or, or whatever. It creates a lot of good community within the company. And also I get a lot of good feedback about the company and we figure out things that we can change to keep making things better because more eyeballs on a problem to me is better than less. So I don't know, this idea of like not meeting with a small group of people kind of seems silly. And I'm sure it does give him an extra six or seven hours a day between that and not watching TV. But at a certain point, we have to understand that if you can dictate those kind of rules, you've reached a certain level of privilege within your company or your society that you can dictate that. Saying no to meetings is like saying no to money for a lot of service-based businesses. And while I have turned down clients because I don't agree with their company culture or think they're going to be impossible to work with, I'm not in the position to turn down all meetings from a financial standpoint. And I don't think most people are either. So if you want to have these cool hot takes, that's fine. But I need you to acknowledge that you're making $675,000 running a cohort for one month doing an alt MBA, that you sold a dot-com company at the height of the dot-com boom, and that you probably don't need to make any more money, that you have enough money, and that anything you do at this point is optional. And coming at life from that standpoint makes some of these positions you take a little bit easier to actually implement. And um, I just really wish he would recognize that. So do I think Seth Godin knows what he's talking about? I mean, of course, he understands fundamental things about marketing. So obviously, I don't agree with everything Seth Godin says. I've talked about it during this broadcast enough. I will not reiterate those points. But um, he started approaching talking about privilege and implying his privilege a few times during this conversation. And it was like he was circling the plane, right? And what I wanted him to do was land the plane. And basically say something like, hey, I'm a cishet white man who grew up upper middle class and had access to a world-class education and the network that provides. And I understand that after making a lot of money selling off a tech company during the dot-com boom, that I've had options that other people don't. And that I think that despite the fact the internet has changed since kind of the height of my popularity, that there is still some things coming out of it. And just because things are changing doesn't mean that the ideas I've talked about with permission marketing and with creating excellent products and an excellent company culture are not something that are still important today. I think he has great examples in his books and otherwise. I do think some of his takes are old fashioned and privileged. Old fashioned, for example, because he seems to dismiss social media a couple times in this as maybe a bit of a time waster and maybe only good if you want to, I don't know, take out a super targeted ad to a specific group of people. But most businesses, who need to make money can't really afford to ignore social media as an engine of marketing that they could be accessing and using in the way that Seth Godin seems like he generally ignores it. And I also wish that he would use his privilege to elevate people who are doing new and interesting things, voices maybe that aren't being heard as loudly as his to say, hey, this, you know, young woman of color is doing excellent things or hey, this you know, a person is doing amazing work on TikTok, he would have the 
audience and respect to get people to listen to him. But I think he's just kind of done. I mean, he's had a long career and I, and I get it, but I guess part of me wishes he would use his platform a little bit more intentionally to elevate new voices to speak about what's going on in marketing now. So thanks so much for watching. If you want to watch more videos like this, check out the Nicole Reacts playlist on the YouTube channel, which has all of the videos in the series. If you have a specific guru you'd like me to react to, or even a specific video you want me to react to, please leave it in the comments. I would love to check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time. Take care.